Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm Tobias Locke from the University of Edinburgh. I'm not going to do anything today apart from chairing this panel. We've got two speakers here. Um, Dr. Alexandra Stein, or Stein, I should probably say, who is uh, head of the Scottish Government's Innovation and Inve Investment Hub in Berlin, which only recently opened. She is originally from Germany, but she made her way via England, I believe. No, from Scotland. You're originally from Scotland. Scottish. Scottish. <laughs> oh, Scottish. Goodness, somebody Born told Scottish. me. Oh. Well, but you have a PhD in German. I do. Now, <laughs> at least something uh, from Oxford. Well, not Edinburgh, not everyone's perfect, but she's been a Scottish civil servant for since almost devolution, I think. Is yep. that right? And, and she uh, is now heading this uh, new uh, Scottish um, embassy in Berlin. Um, and the other speaker we're going to have is uh, Senator Neil Richmond. Uh, he's the chair of the Senate uh, Brexit Committee. He uh, entered the Irish Senate in 2016, and before mm -hmm. that he served as a a local councillor in Dunleary, Rathdown, and he has also sat on the EU's committee on the region of the regions, and is of course uh, one of the people who, who know the most from an Irish perspective about all these very many questions that we have got. I think I should briefly mention that uh, the minister, Mike Russell, is unfortunately ill and he couldn't come today, but I'm sure Alexandra is going to represent him in all his glory. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll do my best. Excellent. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and also to be invited to give the Scottish Government perspective on Brexit. Um, as, you, as you say, on behalf of Mike Russell, who is unfortunately is, is ill, and he sends his apologies. Um, I think it's worth noting in that context that some of my remarks are those who were actually are those that were actually prepared for the minister with my own Berlin slant on, on this. So I mean, I think given my role, this is pretty much the perfect event for me because I'm in the in the position to be able to bring perspectives from Scotland and Germany to Ireland, which I think is apt for today. Um, so as you'll, you know, as everybody's aware, the Scottish people voted decisively in June 2016 to remain within the EU. And the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament both represent these perspectives. And I would say since 2016, the Scottish Government position has been consistent, in th including through publications such as Scotland's Place in Europe. So th the view is that Scotland didn't vote for Brexit, a majority don't want it. And the evidence produced by both the UK and Scottish governments shows that Brexit is expected to be economically detrimental. It's likely to um, damage Scotland's economic, social and cultural interests and also hit jobs and living standards. So ministers want Scotland to remain within the European Union and failing that, they believe that remaining in the single market and the customs union is the least worst option. But nevertheless, as a responsible government, the Scottish government is intensifying its preparations for all EU exit possibilities in order to be able to support the Scottish economy, businesses and workers through uncertain times. So in preparing for EU exit, the Scottish Government's priorities are to influence UK Government's nego negotiating permissions, uh, positions and surrounding debate, both on the EU-UK relationship and other international agreements, to secure the repatriation of devolved powers and reach agreement with the UK Government on financial arrangements, to negotiate UK frameworks to replace EU law where necessary and secure an improved system of UK intergovernmental decision-making uh, more generally, to design and implement economic, social and environmental policies for both post-withdrawal scenarios and support the public, private and third sectors in their preparations, and to influence UK migration policy and mitigate the impact of EU exit on the Scottish labour market, organisations and individuals where possible. So it wants to identify and mitigate as far as possible other risks, including to funding, the provision of public services and continuity of supply of goods and services and to ensure the competent delivery of operational functions such as the enforcement of fisheries and grant scheme administration and the efficient regulation of business. And then finally, to legislate to de deliver a functioning devolved statute book on EU exit in order to deliver all of the above. Now, if we look to the impact on devolution, I think it's fair to say that we're now in constitutionally uncharted waters. In the operation of devolved powers since 1999, the Sewell Convention has ensured that the UK Parliament will not normally legislate on devolved matters or change the devolution settlement without the agreement of the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> the implications of Brexit for these constitutional agreements are not yet clear, most notably in relation to the passing on of powers that would normally fall under currently devolved uh, competences. 
And as everyone here knows, the UK and the EU are currently negoti negotiating two linked key issues. The first is the withdrawal agreement, which will determine what happens immediately after the UK leaves the EU during a transition period which is currently scheduled to last until the end of 2020. So Scottish ministers are of the view that if it does prove possible to conclude a withdrawal agreement, which we'll hope, such an agreement should allow for an extension to the transition period, should that prove necessary. Because without that flexibility, there's a real danger that a cliff edge in March 2019 becomes a cliff edge in January 2021. And of course, there are still many unresolved issues with the withdrawal agreement, including issues critical to Scotland, such as geographical indicators for food, as already mentioned. But as, as, as we all know here today, the single most difficult issue is to how to maintain an open border on the island of Ireland. And of course, it's also worth noting that, a withdrawal agree that without any withdrawal agreement, there will also be no transition period. The second negotiation relates to the political declaration which, which will accompany the withdrawal agreement. And this sets out the framework which will de de determine the long-term relationship between the UK and the EU. So Scottish ministers consider the choice of the Chequers agreement or no deal to be a false one. They believe that Chequers, although an improvement, is still impractical. So, for example, it tries to separate goods and services, despite the fact that goods are increasingly sold, for example, with services such as maintenance contracts. And that's something we've heard very often from the BDI in Germany. I think their, their, their view on that has been consistent. And so ministers believe that an approach that fails to cover services would be deeply damaging to Scotland and the UK, since services constitute four-fifths of our economy and two-fifths of our exports to the EU. The UK as a whole has a trade deficit with the EU in goods and a trade surplus in services. So taking us out of the single market in services would knowingly cause harm to our economy. But ministers also believe the, the, that the choice between checkers and no deal is false because the EU is never likely to accept some of its key elements. So, for example, by keeping the free movement of goods but not services or people, checkers undermines the unity of the single market. And this has always been acceptable to, unacceptable to the EU, as reiterated by Michel Barnier. So I think at this point it may be worth bringing in a couple of observations from Germany. Um, you know, in my view, the German government has maintained a consistent position on Brexit ever since the UK referendum. It consistently reiterates the integrity of the single market, the indivisibility of the four freedoms, the fact that negotiations are conducted by Barney in Brussels, and the fact that there should be no attempt to split the EU 27. And there's been no departure from the position that a country leaving the EU should also lose the advantages of belonging to, to the EU. Therefore, political figures, including Merkel, state that they deeply regret Brexit, but that they will respect Britain's democratic processes. At the same time, they do not want the deal to set a precedent for others, and they also consider that it is for the UK to come up with a workable solution. Taking this into account, they nevertheless wish to maintain the best possible relationship with the UK, particularly on internal and external security. So this has created a position of, of principle that has been notably stable and consistent, and it's also been clearly communicated for those who are listening. Salzburg was not a surprise in Germany, though EU, sorry, the UK engagement over the summer into, into September clearly started to win around significant parts of the German press. And I would say that uh, frustration is clearly now increasing at the lack of any clear solution from the UK, but there is still willingness to soften messaging around the edges and to look for the positive going forward, so i.e. to be supportive and helpful without shifting on fundamentals. But with the end of November looming as a practical deadline for withdrawal agreement, Merkel has highlighted just this last week the amount of hard work that still has to be done in the next six to eight weeks. And I think one of the reasons why the German view is so consistent is that the EU, to my mind, has become a fundamental part of the German identity, with a firm belief in multilateralism as the only way to continue to ensure peace and prosperity in Europe mm -hmm. and to respond to global challenges. Scottish ministers likewise consider that there are many areas where decisions taken by the European Union are more effective than ones taken by 28 individual nations. For example, in consumer issues such as roaming charges and data protection, or major international agreements such as those on climate change. And in addition, Scotland welcomes migration. It has a long-standing history of accepting migrants from across the globe, and the Scottish Government believes that immigration and the free movement of people have brought major benefits. There are approximately 23,000 Irish and 22,500 German nationals who call, call Scotland their home. And furthermore, Scotland has a very specific need, as without immigration, the population is likely to fall over the next few decades. 
So this week, the Prime Minister stated that after Brexit, the free movement of people will end. The Scottish Government does not agree with this permission, position and will continue to press for the devolution of migration powers in order to take control of Scotland's population needs. Despite Brexit, the Scottish Government is strongly committed to continuing engagement with our European neighbours and it is determined that this will remain the case after March 2019. Scotland has strong and viable links with its European partners, with Germany and Ireland at the forefront. And this is why we opened hubs here in Dublin and in Berlin with Paris to follow. And I think the Dublin hub in particular has had a widely recognised impact on Scottish-Irish relations. It's also why our main enterprise agency has in the last two years doubled its staff on mainland Europe. And it's why all our overseas offices are working hard to pursue new cultural, education and business connections with regions, nations and groups of nations. In Germany, it's why the hope opening of our hub in April showcased Scotland's young ambassadors, the European Championships and our strong innovation entrepreneurship offering, as well as the signing of an MOU between the Glasgow and the Berlin Chambers of Commerce. It's why the First Minister came to a trade mission to Berlin in June and met the Federal, State, uh, Federal Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. And it's one of the reasons why we worked so closely with Berlin throughout the summer to build on our relationships through the Glasgow Championships, which were co-hosted by Berlin and uh, Glasgow in August. So ministers hope that a sensible conclusion on Brexit can be reached in the coming weeks. Whatever the outcome, they are clear that Scotland's relationship with other European countries matters and they will step up our efforts to engage, not step away. The achievements of the European Union go far beyond the economic. The challenges of the future, from data protection to climate change, from health improvement and an ageing population, to ensuring that technological ch change and automation benefit everyone, these cannot be solved by individual nations alone. Scottish ministers consider that these require multilateral cooperation and collaboration within a framework of rules. They require the best of our researchers and our innovators to work together across countries, creating solutions for a sustainable future. And this is why we will continue to reach out to Ireland, to Germany and to the rest of Europe, seeking to build on our close ties to find multilateral solutions to our global challenges. Whatever the next six months may bring, ministers are determined to show that Scotland remains open, outward facing and a welcoming country and a positive, constructive partner to our European friends. Scotland greatly values our partnerships and alliance and we look forward to strengthening these wherever this is possible. I think so all that remains me is to thank you for having me here today and to wish both, both Mike Russell and my Dublin colleague John Web Webster, who many of you know, a speedy recovery and a good to best strong. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Alexandra, and thank you very much, Tobias, for the introduction. Um, from the outset, I would like to thank our host, the IIEA, for once again putting on a very timely and excellent seminar. I'm also very grateful for your graphic designer truly depicting the current Irish border so accurately. Um, very grateful to the Scottish Centre on European Relations for showing consistent interest in everything that's going on in Ireland and indeed flying me to Glasgow on Sunday. I look forward to it. And the Conrad Adenauer Stuftung, who had the pleasure of flying me to London in July. For anyone wondering, I'm free to go wherever you'll bring me. Um, <laughs> I had a speech written, but I wrote it a week ago. And it was probably one of the silliest things I did because I texted a panelist in a later session who will remain nameless, but you can probably guess who I still text in this room. And I asked them, um, have you written a speech? And they laughed and said, oh, why would you write a speech so soon? Who knows what could happen between now and next week? And that's a very true statement. And a lot has happened, but ultimately nothing's happened. And I think that kind of has summed up the last two and a half years in the on-running saga that is Brexit, something that I am immensely grateful for because it means I get to go on Newsnight and the people of Dublin right there and watch Newsnight. Um, but all's changed and nothing's changed. And you could argue from the very outset, nothing's changed. And I suppose when you talk about timelines, and there's a lot of few areas that I could speak about, but um, you're going to have some panels with some real experts that I'm going to leave that to. But if you look at the timeline of where we've come and where we're going, it's quite telling. And one thing that's repeated, I, I speak with multiple hats here. I'll try and speak on behalf of the Irish government until I say something inappropriate, at which stage I'll revert to the Shannon Brexit Committee until I get a frown from the clerk who's in the audience. And then I'll just speak as myself, and I can't blame anyone else at that stage, nor can I get in too much trouble. So the immediate timeline is very, very short. The fact that we're still having so many discussions and negotiations that are ongoing in Brussels is really worrying. 
and is bad business practice, but Brexit isn't a business decision. If it was, that business would have gone bankrupt two and a half years ago. Brexit is a political decision, a terrible political decision. There is no such thing as a good Brexit, despite what some people will try and sell. And it's very easy to say that to an audience like this in Dublin, but I'll happily say it to an audience in London or Birmingham or Sunderland or Newcastle in two or three years' time when there is job losses, regardless of what Brexit is, soft, hard, medium, rare, or no deal. The timeline, as it's been so far, has been a timeline of missed deadlines and missed opportunities. The deal that was agreed in December still stands, and despite what some now former ministers who pretend they weren't really listening very hard at the cabinet table will say, that agreement stands, and what we're waiting for now is the legal manifestation of that agreement. The European Commission presented their legal interpretation a number of months ago. I think, it, I don't know how possibly it could be, it was turned down so quickly, I don't know how possibly the Prime Minister could have read it and given it the due diligence, but it was turned down, and there's no problem with turning stuff down. But the key thing is, if you're turning something down, you need to have an alternative proposal. And we still wait with nine days left to get that alternative proposal. And I can't stress strongly enough today the importance of receiving the British interpretation of that backstop agreement. We would have liked it six months ago, but we'll take it in six days. And it needs to come, it needs to be workable, and it needs to really appreciate. And Alexandria touched about exactly what we are negotiating at the moment. It's the withdrawal agreement. We're not in free trade negotiations. They're a long way away. And anyone who would have followed the free trade negotiations with Canada or South Korea or Japan that the Commission held know that they take an awfully long time. But we are negotiating the withdrawal agreement, first and foremost, and that gets forgotten about a lot in the Brexiteer media and the Tory fringe. And the withdrawal agreement focuses on three key issues. The first two have more or less been settled, and the third one is 85% there, I am told by the Taunashta as of this morning. The first one is on the bill. The UK are paying more than they want. The Europeans are receiving less than they want. We can all live with that. It's not ideal. But must remind the people of Great Britain that they will continue to receive a return on that bill right up until 2020. It's not, uh, and it's not some sort of one-off payment. You do get a return on that payment. The second thing is citizens' rights. And um, Alexandra detailed the amount of Irish people living in Germany and Scotland and vice versa. And it's quite apparent that more or less there's the same amount of British people living in EU countries as there is European citizens living in, uh, living in the UK. And before we come to the complicated matter of people in Northern Ireland who see themselves as British, Irish, Northern Irish, all three, and depends on who's playing in the football. Which brings me to the, fi the final key issue of the withdrawal agreement that is being negotiated, and that is in relation to Ireland. And I did say we are 85% of the way there. Citizens' rights has been dealt with in the second issue. The common travel area going back to 1922 makes most of those things fairly straightforward. However, what is the issue is the border and how we can continue to be compliant with the Good Friday Agreement, an international peace treaty lodged with the United Nations, of which the Irish and British governments are both co co-guarantors. It rolls off the tongue, I say it so much, because so many people want to rewrite this brilliant agreement. And I say it was brilliant because, let's be fair, I was 15 in 1998. I wasn't, uh, and I know some people in the room were actually up negotiating it, so I'm not going to pretend to have that detailed expert knowledge, apart from going to visit the cousins who were all unionists in the north and wondering why my Jack, the La Jack Charlton, Jack the Lad shorts had been hidden the night before by my mother. But I do remember being chilled to the bone by the TV ads on ITV or UTV as it was, you know, with the Cat Stevens soundtrack. That's not very nice when you're 11 or 12. And someone said to me this morning, well, it has to have a timeline on the backstop. And I quite bluntly said that you don't put a timeline on peace. Peace should always be forever. And Europe, the project of Europe, the dream of Europe is absolutely something that is rooted in the desire for continued peace and our confidence and indeed desired peace internally and within this island. So that's absolutely why the backstop is so important. And it should not be dismissed as which. It should not be seen as a, a difficult issue that can be managed or it can be tweaked or it can be thrown away or that it can be renegotiated. I don't care if your lines are blood red or blood of the Ulster League and Covenant. The backstop is vitally important, not just to the Irish government, but the entire European negotiating side. And that's what this is. It's a negotiation between the European Commission and the United Kingdom. It's not a bilateral negotiation between Dublin and London, or indeed Belfast, Dublin and London, a little trilateral. And that negotiation has to secure, in the future, a common trading and customs arrangement, association, union, whatever you have to call it to get over the line, 
that will make sure that that backstop is never, ever needed. Because it's not something anyone ever wants to see come into place, because it's not exactly desirable. Nothing about Brexit is desirable. What we have now is perfectly good, thank you very much. It's not my fault people made bad decisions on a different island next door, but we have to manage the impacts thereof. So we face a number of challenges. We face them in a very short period of time. And then there's a couple other challenges that will come, two key challenges that will come um, if we do reach a deal. And I, and I will underline that I do think we are going to reach a deal. I would like to say it'll be before the European Council meeting of October, but um, I'm not prepared to say that. Um, but others will say it absolutely will be, but I don't want to make myself sound foolish. Um, but I also think that people are right to focus on trying to get it by then. A potential emergency European Council meeting clashes with Ireland against New Zealand in the Aviva, and I really don't want to be spending my days following one thing rather than the other. We have to work until the very last second to get a deal to the European Council to allow Michel Barnier to bring it to the Council to then send to the two key challenges that I'm starting to see, one of which is documented in great detail and gets all the coverage and it gets all the glamour and it gets all the noise and it gets all the incorrect commentary and that's getting whatever this deal will be called through Westminster um, be it checkers or whatever they'll, they'll have to come up with a, a name for it Canada triple plus or whatever the teacher referred to it as yesterday and that's fine and we'll go through that but on the European side and the Irish side that isn't our responsibility we don't go over and negotiate with backbench MPs or try and peel off rebel Tories or rebel Labour people or the SNP Despite what some people might think, the European Commission negotiates in good faith with the British government, and the Irish government supports that wholly. Our negotiator is Michel Barnier, it's no one else. It'll get through Westminster, I hope. It needs to get through Westminster, and I think it's in everyone's interest to get it through Westminster, because I don't need to detail what the alternative is, because if I do, I'll be labelled as a fearmonger by the Daily Express. Philip Hammond, I suppose, is a fearmonger now after his comments this week when exactly he's just been stating what most of us have been stating for uh, six months, if not two years. And you'll hear, I'm sure, a lot more detail about it. But one key area that I would like to make reference about, and it hasn't been mentioned, and I know Francis Jacobs in the audience, he might annoy, be annoyed that I pull you out, but this deal has to get approved by another body. And it's lost constantly in the British media that all the European Council is doing is sending this deal, the withdrawal agreement, to the European Parliament to get its assent. The European Parliament has set the date that it will get that assent to the 12th and 13th of March. It's set in stone. The timeline is rigid. Article 50 is rigid. It's a very rigid legal process initiated by the British government. If people think it isn't long enough, then you shouldn't have initiated the article in the first place. Really shouldn't have voted for Brexit in the first place, but I think I've said that enough times already. The European Parliament um, is an institution I'm quite familiar with because not only was I stagiaire there, but I was a parliamentary assistant um, carrying around Gay Mitchell's suitcase. But occasionally I got the opportunity to learn a few things and see a few things in action. And Francis might correct me afterwards, but I have never seen a report get through a European Parliament in anything less than six to eight weeks. The process is lengthy, the process is detailed between getting through group stage, committee stage, and actually getting to the floor of the plenary, be it in Strasbourg or a mini plenary in Brussels, is not that straightforward. And you can talk about the difficulty of Theresa May having to rely on the DUP or the factions within their own party, I would like you to re refer to one, the minority government status in this country. I'd love to have just a, a majority, be, be just tie 10 short of a majority in the Dáil compared to our, our now 50 Fine Gael TDs. Um, it's not a great position. There's 20 of us in the Senate, if anyone ever cares about the Senate. But then the other issue is the European Parliament. The EPP, of which Fine Gael is a constituent member of, is obviously the largest group. And we've heard from the statements from the leader of our group, Manfred Weber, and indeed the EPP president of the European Parliament, Antonio Tajani, the continued European solidarity that has been always forthcoming. However, what's the alliance running the European Parliament at the moment? It changed a couple of years ago. It's now the EPP supported by the Aldi Liberal Group, of which Giver Hofstadt uh, is the leader, and the ECR, of which Saeed Kamal is the leader. The ECR, of course, um, the home of the British Conservative Party, the Polish League and um, Truth and Justice, or whatever they are, and a number of the Eurosceptic parties from Czech Republic and Denmark. So how do we get that through the European Parliament? That's my question now. I have great faith and hope that the grand coalition of the Christian Democrats and Social Democrats come together and see sense but it's not a guaranteed. And anyone who thinks this ends simply when a deal is struck or that all the responsibility goes to Westminster, once again, will be taking European politics and European solidarity for absolute granted. I wish you all the best for the rest of the seminar. Thank you very much for listening to me.
much. Um, now everyone's depressed, uh, but that's probably the, the right mood to be in uh, today. Um, maybe we've got time for one or two questions, very quick ones and quick answers as well. If, if there's anybody who's not too depressed, maybe. So you're suggesting there at the end that the Parliament might reject the, the, the deal. So what would happen then with that? Article 30 would presumably still go ahead. Or would they, they pull Article 30 as, as a result? You don't know what happens if Westminster rejects the deal. It's the exact same process. This is the tricky thing. We're going into a great unknown that I think hasn't received the level of attention that it merits. I have absolute faith, I will say, that it will get through the European Parliament due to the work of the negotiating team of bringing the Parliament task force along the process. But I think it's something, as is constantly being done, that is uh, being underestimated. And the gentleman at the back there. Yeah, I, this question may be superfluous now. Um, is there any real prospect that if the European Council uh, agrees on the shape of a deal, I'm doubtful about it, but you know, I'm a pessimist by nature about these things, but if the European Council were to agree on a deal like that, what possible logic could there be for the Parliament to reject it? There's European elections in May. <laughs> a lot of people, again, the makeup of the ESR group is very worrying. Uh, a lot of people look for their moment in, su in the sun. And you've got to remember the, the level of federalism in the European Parliament, true European federalism, that might still be quite smarting from the Brexit decision is higher. It is a speculative one, but I just think it's something that deserves a little bit more attention and consideration. It's not a done deal once it gets through the Council. Well, thank you very much to our two keynote speakers. They've really set us up for the rest of the afternoon, and we'll just move on to the next panel then. Thank you very much. <laughs>